Rudolf Hess was born on November 25, 1900, in Baden-Baden, Germany. He was raised Catholic, and his father destined him to become a priest. When he was 13 years old, during class, he accidentally pushed his classmate down the stairs and injured him. In the afternoon, he went to church, where he made a confession. In the evening, the confessor visited his parents and told them about the accident. Rudolf knew that the seal of confession is sacrosanct, even when it comes to gross crimes. Breaking the seal of confession by the priest shook his faith. He never made a confession again, and against his father's will, instead of becoming a priest, he joined the army. During the First World War, Hearst fought in Palestine. While patrolling by the River Jordan, he encountered some peasants transporting moss on carts. They explained that they were taking it to churches and monasteries in Jerusalem. The moss was grayish with white-red spots. He soon discovered that Catholic churches and monasteries in the entire Palestine were selling it to the pilgrims, claiming it was from Golgotha, and that the red spots were supposed to be the blood of Christ. Horrified by the actions of the church, he turned away from God. In 1933, Rudolf Hirsch joined the SS. He served in the Dachau and Sachsenhausen camps. On September 15th, he commanded the execution of August Dickmann, a Jehovah Witness, who was the first prisoner executed for refusing military service in Vermont. On May 4th, 1940, Heinrich Himmler appointed Hirsch as the commandant of the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp, entrusting him with building it. Hearst was the commandant until December 1, 1943. The Third Reich awarded him the War Merit Cross first and second class for his credit in the extermination of Jews and Slavs. Hearst lived in a villa next to the Commandant's headquarters building. His private life kept going as if nothing bad had been happening. He was happy with his wife and five children. After that, he was appointed as the head of Amstgruppe D of SS Main Economic and Administrative Office. In May 1944, by the order of Himmler, he came back to Auschwitz-Birkenau in order to supervise the mass extermination of Hungarian Jews. Following the demise of the Third Reich on March 11, 1946, he was captured by a British group pursuing war criminals. 
On May 25th, he was extradited to Polish authorities. At the end of this lecture, I will describe what he had gone through before he was hanged. Can people like Rudolf Hirsch have any hope for God's forgiveness? Will they be in heaven? To answer these questions, let's read a passage written by St. Paul from the Book of Romans about divine grace. The Book of Romans is a theological dissertation about divine clemency and forgiveness of sins through faith. Apostle Paul describes how to gain God's forgiveness and win back immortality. Today we will learn about the secret of salvation written in Romans, chapter 5, verses 15 through 19. Let's take a look at the meaning of the most crucial Greek words that can be found in this passage in order to fully understand Paul's teachings. The first word is charis. Charis means grace, kindness, goodwill, kind care, sign of clemency, gift of grace, blessing, courtesy, a gesture of grace. The small dictionary of the Polish language specifies what grace is. The dictionary describes grace as a legal term meaning pardon or mitigation of sentence, clemency and forgiveness. The dictionary led me to the definition of power of pardon. Power of pardon means a power of remission of the sentence or leniency given by the president. Hers wrote a request for pardon to President Bolesław Bierut, but was denied. The lexicon of Polish scientific publishers describes grace as divine care given without merit to a person. Generally speaking, grace is therefore something given to somebody without them deserving it. The second Greek word is charisma. Charisma means gift of grace, grace, grace in the sense of the gift of grace. The third word is dorema. Dorema means a gift, something that somebody gives or offers to someone. The fourth word is dorea. Dorea is a donation. A donation is a legal term. An agreement where one party, the owner, voluntarily and freely gives a particular thing to the other party. So, a donation is a gift that is legally bound, has a legal force, and it is guaranteed almost irrevocably, with some exceptions, and cannot be revoked. To avoid any misunderstandings concerning this text, I am using the Greek-Polish New Testament, interlinear edition of primatial Bible series. In the 15th verse, Paul writes, but not as the beside fall, thus, and the grace effect, if for to thee of the one beside fall, the many from died too much, rather the grace of the God and the gratuity, in grace to thee of the one human, Jesus anointed into the many exceeds. For a better understanding of this fragment, concerning previous remarks, I suggest this translation. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, 
hath abounded unto many. What does Paul tell us in this verse? The fall of Adam brought death upon our world. Similarly, the redemption made by one man, Jesus, granted everyone God's grace. Jesus Christ gave everyone a donation of forgiveness based on grace. Paul writes here about a donation in grace. He is referring to a donation that we are not worthy of. Nevertheless, it is given to us because of God's love. God, as the President of the universe, gave us the power of pardon. It was made possible because Jesus took our sins and received punishment for them. The power of pardon is given to every sinner without exception. Even to Rudolf Hers. But will he ask God for mercy? We will find out in a moment. In verse 16 we read, and not as through one sinning the gratuity, the indeed for judgment, out of one into condemnation, the yet gracious gift, out of many offenses, into just, just effect. I propose the following translation of this passage. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. In verse 16, Paul mentioned the new meaning of God's forgiveness due to the universal law of causality. Every effect has its cause, and every cause induces an effect. The mankind was burdened with the effects of Adam's sin. The reference here is about the effects of Adam's sin and not the effect of blaming us for his fall. We are not to be blamed for his fall. We are not guilty of what he did but the effects of his wrong choice embraced us all. Thanks to Jesus, God offers us a gift of grace. It is something that we do not deserve, but he gives us clemency despite many of our transgressions. In verse 17, Paul writes, If for to thee of the one offense the death reigns through the one too much, rather the once, the excess of the grace and of the gratuity of the justice getting up in life shall be reigning through the one Jesus anointed. To match this fragment to the style and grammar of the Polish language, I propose the following translation. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. The sin of Adam was the cause of death and evil taking over the earth. Death is Adam's consequence. Similarly, only one person, Jesus, took the world's blame on himself. Based on this, the Lord used the power of pardon, which freed us from being condemned for our sins. The Son of God willed us his justice with his own blood and therefore we regained immortality. 
In verse 18, Paul writes, Consequently then, as through one beside fall into all humans, into condemnation, thus and through one just effect into all humans, into justifying of life. This fragment can also be translated as Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Here, the Apostle explains the idea of forgiveness through faith. Because of Adam's fall, we embarked on the path of evil. The consequences of his sin became ours too. This provokes us to act against God's law, drawing judgment for our sins. Because of redemption made by Jesus Christ, we regained grace, God's forgiveness. If we accept it with faith, it guarantees us salvation. The acts of Jesus Himself gave His Father the ability to use the power of pardon toward us, which automatically removes the guilt from us. In verse 19, Paul writes, as even for through the disobedience of the one, human sinners were constituted the many, thus and through the obedience of the one, just shall be being constituted the many. The verse 19 can sound like this. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam by implication, Many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, Jesus, by implication, shall many be made righteous. Paul, in the book of Romans, states that because of his sin, Adam lost his holy nature. Children inherit traits from their parents so humankind inherited the tendencies to do evil things from Him. By succumbing to them, we broke God's laws and became sinners. Jesus was obedient to God's law, and by not giving in to sin, He remained absolutely holy. Jesus, driven by love, gave a donation of His holiness to us and took our sinfulness upon Himself. That way, considered sinful by us, He died condemned not by His sins, but by ours, since He didn't have His own. One holy man, Jesus, made atonement for humankind's guilt. The Lord accepted His perfect sacrifice and forgave the faithful their sins, and cancelled the punishment for violating God's law. The theology of Paul shown in this excerpt from the Book of Romans regarding the salvation of humankind comes down to the following conclusions. The work of creation was perfect, a perfect man in a perfect world, but the fall of Adam destroyed it all. It introduced the misery of sin and death to this world. Everything destroyed by Adam was fixed by Jesus Christ of Nazareth. By making atonement, Jesus obtained forgiveness and clemency for people, restoring a bond between humankind and God. He enabled the faithful to regain immortality. I didn't contribute to Adam's fall. I am not to be blamed for the sin that's been dominating the world. 
It is not my fault that I was born as a defective human, prone to evil. As I got older, I succumbed to sinful nature. I became the victim of sin, which despite my common sense, caught me like a predator catches its prey. All this was left by Adam as his legacy. He left me the donation of sin and death. The sin and death took me over from the outside, invaded my life and enslaved me. Forgiveness for my sins and reuniting with God is not my credit. I couldn't regain eternal life and freed myself from breaking God's law. Based on the sacrifice made by Jesus, I was given a donation of His justice. Thanks to the contributions made by Jesus Christ, the President of the universe used the power of pardon on me. Following his arrival in Poland, Hearst was imprisoned in the Mokotów prison at Rakowiecka Street in Warsaw, which survived warfare in the Warsaw Uprising. In this building, which survived warfare in the Warsaw Uprising, and which one side is on the Wybrzeża Kościuszkowskie Street, and the other side is on the Smulikowskiego Street in Warsaw, the trial of Rudolf Hess began on March 11, 1947. On April 2, the Supreme National Tribunal sentenced him to death. Two days later, Hess was transported to a prison in Wadowice. In this building, from the side on the Smulikowskiego Street in Warsaw, the trial of Rudolf Hearst took place. During the trial, a witness testified that a group of female prisoners from Auschwitz passed by Rudolf and an SS men group. Suddenly, one of the women, who was pregnant, fell down and suffered a miscarriage. Her companions dragged her to the camp's barracks. One of the SS men unleashed his dog, which then devoured the fetus, lying in a pool of blood. Hearst, a religious man who was destined to become a priest, was disgusted by the proceedings of the Catholic Church and turned away from God. When religion let him down, he found the meaning of life in serving Germany. In prison, he realized that scandalous proceedings of the Church have to be separated from faith. The fact that many clergymen do bad things doesn't mean that there is no God. At Hearst's request, a priest came to his cell. In front of him, he reconciled with God, confessed his sins, was absolved and received the Holy Communion. The day after writing his farewell letters, Hearst gave the prosecutor a statement asking him to publish it. He recognized the responsibility for Auschwitz-Birkenau and apologized to the Polish nation for his cruel crimes. In the solitude of my prison cell, I have come to the bitter recognition that I have sinned gravely against humanity. As the Commandant of Auschwitz, I was responsible for carrying out part of the cruel plans of the Third Reich for human destruction. In so doing, I have inflicted terrible wounds on humanity. I caused unspeakable suffering to the Polish people in particular. I am to pay for this with my life. May the Lord God forgive one day what I have done. I ask the Polish people for forgiveness. In Polish prisons I experienced for the first time what human kindness is. Despite all that has happened, 
I have experienced humane treatment which I could never have expected and which has deeply shamed me. May the facts which are now coming out about the horrible crimes against humanity make the repetition of such cruel acts impossible for all time. On April 16, 1947, Rudolf Hirsch was transported from Wadowice to the camp in Oświęcim and imprisoned in the grimly infamous Block 11, the Death Block. The sentence was carried out on the same day at 10.08 am by hanging. Hirsch asked for mercy, but President Bierut didn't use the power of pardon on him. Hers apologized the Polish nation and asked for forgiveness. Did the nation forgive him? The history mentions that the execution of Hers was supposed to happen two days earlier, but the people of Oświęcim wanted to lynch him. That is why the execution was postponed and was not publicized. The Supreme National Tribunal also didn't recognize his remorse and sentenced him to be hanged. Hers confessed his sins to God in the Wadowice prison and asked the Creator for forgiveness. Did God forgive him? Will Hers be in heaven? Did the blood of Jesus wash away his horrible crimes? The truth about justification by faith written by Paul in the book of Romans convinced me that if God found Hersa's conversion as sincere, he will be in heaven because Christ took his fault upon himself and gave him his justice. Jesus once said, And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. <laughs>